So this is my third confounding video, and this one's all about how to control for confounding. Um, it would be helpful if you would see in my other two confounding videos, one's just an overview and one's um, how to detect confounding. And this one's going to be all about uh, both methodological and analytical ways to control for confounding. Um, so the main methodological ones are matching, restriction, and randomization. And as far as analytical ways of controlling, there's stratification, which I'll just briefly touch on, and inclusion in the regression, which I will spend a little more time on. Um, yeah, so if we're interested in investigating the relationship between fatty diet and liver disease, and we're worried that, oh yeah, and we're going to be just following this population that ideally will be exchangeable, so we have those who have a, a fatty diet and those who have a healthy diet, and if we're looking at the rate of liver disease in the two populations, ideally we want to isolate the effect of diet, so we want that to be the only way these, these two groups differ. However, uh, people generally self-assign themselves to exposure, so if someone chooses a fatty diet, and those who choose a fatty diet and those who don't might differ by some other variables, and that becomes an issue especially if that variable is also related to the outcome, which would represent a confounder. So here we are kind of hypothesizing that uh, those who engage in high alcohol consumption uh, might be more likely to have a fatty diet, while uh, the, the more kind of reasonable explanation is those who engage in a healthy diet might be healthy, health conscious overall and uh, might be uh, more likely to choose to consume less alcohol or no alcohol at all. Um, so now if we measured high alcohol consumption, where high alcohol consumption here is the blue people, we can see that um, those who self-assigned themselves a fatty diet, those who engage in a fatty diet, uh, there's a higher prevalence of alcohol consumption in this group and they're no longer exchangeable. Um, the, the, this is the non-exchangeable situation. Um, if we were able to do something that made these two groups similar with respect to alcohol consumption, here we have a group where um, this, this has six people with high, high alcohol consumption and, and this group has five, we're just gonna assume that's enough for them to be exchangeable. And what I mean by exchangeable is that we could switch what diet these these two groups have and we would still be able to detect the effect of, of a fatty diet on liver disease. So basically all the ways that we um, control for confounding methodologically are trying to go from this uneven distribution and do things in the design that makes the, the two populations more similar with respect to everything except this exposure of interest. So the most powerful and well-known way to do this is random randomization, so random assignment to fatty diet. Um, the main reason for this is the reason these two groups differ in their distribution of alcohol consumption is because they, they self-assign themselves to a fatty diet or a healthy diet, and that choice to self-assign yourself was related to several other things, one of which was alcohol consumption. But if we take that choice away and randomly assign a treatment, um, what we're doing is, is breaking down that relationship. Fatty diet can no longer be related to alcohol consumption uh, because we randomly assigned diet. Not that that would be ethical, um, this is just to illustrate randomization. So what that would look like is just like jumbling the, the population into one group and then randomly allocating them to the two diets. And the higher your population is, the more likely it's gonna end up being similar. This is just an example where I made it similar on purpose. Um, but yeah, randomization is likely to um, distribute this confounding variable evenly uh, because everyone had the same probability of going left and right and there's no, there's no systematic reasoning to who went left and who went right the way people typically behave in the real world. And this is kind of the, crux of why observational research is difficult uh, because you're having to try and try and conceptualize every way this fatty diet group and healthy diet group might be different and find ways to measure and control that or, ex or methodologically control that. But randomization is nice because you don't even need to know all of the confounders. By randomly assigning everyone left and right, 
you're going to automatically, you're likely going to automatically uh, control both known and unknown confounders. So people really respect randomization. It's powerful to control for confounding. Um, like I said, it controls for both known and unknown confounders because that's a main justification with observational research is um, you might say to someone like, hey, we, we controlled for alcohol consumption, so these two groups are exchangeable. And someone could easily say, um, what if there's some other one you didn't know about so you didn't think to control it? You can't know, you don't know what you don't know, so there's no way to really be able to justify that. You can never be sure. But with randomization, you can be a lot more sure. Um, and it's highly respected by non-epidemiologists, uh, where there's a lot of like uh, clinical people and like research doctors who like won't even give any credence to observational research. Uh, disadvantages are it's expensive, it's unrepresentative of the real world. People make choices. That's that's how people live. They self-assign themselves to all kinds of exposures, and there's several exposures you can't assign to people. Like if it's smoking, you can't you can't tell people to smoke and force them to for a study um, so that's a main limitation of randomization and also with a low sample size it's still possible that um, like for example here it's still possible we could have had more blue people over here just by mere chance through randomization so the larger your population the larger your sample size is the less likely that'll happen though um, another common one is matching and Again, the goal, the same as the other one, is to have um, the distribution of high alcohol consumption so that the number of blue people relative to black people here, we're, we're like, we want that to be as similar in the fatty diet group as the healthy diet group. And we can force that to be true by individually matching people in the two groups by alcohol consumption. So this first person in the fatty diet group has low alcohol consumption. So we find someone with a healthy diet who has a low alcohol consumption. This next person has high alcohol consumption, so we find someone with a healthy diet that has high alcohol consumption. And we do that for everyone. And then we forced um, this group to be the same with respect to this confounder, so it can't be distorting the results. Uh, it's intuitive for controlling confounding. It has some limitations. It's rarely justified to match. Uh, it can be hard to find matches. As soon as you're matching, you can't measure the effect of it. You force them to be equal in the two groups. Um, so as soon as you start modeling it, um, it's going to you're not going to be able to find the measure of effect. You manipulated its distribution. Um, and it can result in overmatching. If the thing you're matching on is almost com completely correlated with the exposure, then all of a sudden, um, you are matching on exposure, basically, which you're gonna you're gonna force there to be no effect. And the last methodological way to control for confounding is restriction. Um, so this is an example where we made it we made it an inclusion criteria to have low alcohol consumption. So everyone in the study has low alcohol consumption, and that's another way we didn't permit alcohol consumption to vary by group. We could have done this also by only including those with high alcohol consumption. Depending on the nature of the confounder, one or the other might be a better choice. So now we're getting into analytical control, which is the most common way. Uh, Mantel Hansel is something I'm going to talk about in another video. It's kind of like the archaic way of, of doing this the same way. Like, it's, it's kind of like comparing finding an odds ratio by a contingency table to finding it by a regression. Um, no one would ever think to, to publish a paper doing it by a contingency table. You're obviously going to do it with regression. Um, so that's kind of the same situation here. So for analytical control of confounding, here we have our, our model where the outcome is the log odds of having liver disease. We have our intercept, our exposure of interest, so have fatty diet, yes or no, and our confounder, alcohol consumption, yes or no. Um, so once we get uh, actual results for this um, results for this model. This will be a number. It'll be the intercept. We'll have a coefficient for fatty diet and a coefficient for alcohol. Um, since this is logistic regression, once we exponentiate these, what we're able to to interpret this as is the odds odds ratio. So the effect of fatty diet when alcohol is held constant. So since alcohol has been controlled in the model, we're looking at the effect of fatty, of fatty diet independent of alcohol. 
And similarly, uh, if we are interested in the effect of alcohol, we're looking at the effect of alcohol on liver disease independent of, of fatty diet. That's what we're able to get from that model. So when I said before that matching doesn't permit you to look at the effect, that's what I mean. We're here, we can both control for alcohol while also knowing its relationship with the outcome, which might be of interest. And another reason it's better than mantle Hansel is that it permits you to have more than one confounder. So if we thought age was also a confounder, now we have the impact of fatty diet on liver disease independent of alcohol and independent of age. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is uh, confounding by indication and propensity scores because that's technically a, a way of controlling confounding. Um, so this is just an example. It's an observational study looking at mortality, the outcome, and two treatments, uh, which are the exposure uh, and the, for heart disease. So antibiotics is given to non-severe cases typically, and valve replacement is given to very severe cases. And note that this isn't a randomized control trial, so the doctor is choosing who gets which treatment, and that's being informed by a whole bunch of factors, uh, like how severe the disease is, and other things about the individual, like how old they are, or how frail they are. So if we have the blue people here as those with severe heart disease, you can see that those in the valve replacement group, there's a much higher rate of those with severe heart disease. Um, than in the antibiotics group. And we're probably going to see more mortality in this group, and we might kind of naively assume that that means that valve replacement isn't effective. Um, but something we need to consider is those people were already way more sick than, than these people, so um, their higher mortality rate here might have nothing to do with valve replacement. It might just have to do with um, the fact that those who receive valve replacement are, are more likely to already be at very late stages of the disease. So that means disease severity is, is essentially a, a confounder here, and that's sometimes hard to quantify. So we use something called propensity scores, where um, the same way in regular regression, we're looking at the outcome as a, as a function of the exposure and stuff, looking at how the exposure influences the outcome. We're looking at disease severity as the, uh, or sorry, uh, treatment as the outcome here, where um, we're looking at the log odds of receiving valve replacement, and we have all these things that are informing how likely someone is to uh, get, treat get, get valve replacement as their treatment. Um, so when I said there's all these things that doctors will consider when deciding whether to give them the uh, valve replacement or antibiotics, we're modeling this. So um, we're looking at someone's probability of, of being given valve replacement as a function of how old they are the size of their intracardial abscess and whether they have comorbidities or not. And in this way, uh, we're able to model this and get coefficients for this. Um, and for each individual, we're able to assign them a score for this. So let's just say someone's 25 and they have one millimeter abscess and no comor comorbidities. We're able to plug that information into the model we got and uh, it'll spit out a score and now we have that as a piece of data assigned to every individual so we can include that in the model. So now we've effectively controlled for severity of disease by controlling for someone's likelihood of receiving the treatment. And uh, yeah, that's a pretty advanced way of controlling for several prognostic factors at once and kind of eliminating confounding by indication. And uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about, just because it has to do with which confounders you control and how to control for it, is the minimally sufficient set. Um, so this is an XY relationship exposure outcome where there's three confounders here, Z1, Z2, and Z3. I de like uh, one, one way to go about it would just be controlling all three. So this is my representation of that, throwing all three into the model and deleting that is me saying we've controlled it. We have isolated this XY relationship, um, but there's a lot of reasons that it might be better to try and control for fewer than, than all three. It might be expensive to collect information on all three. If we're matching, it might be hard to find matches for all combinations. Um, so yeah, if we just controlled Z1 and Z2, you'll notice that Z3 now has no way of getting to X. It can only get to X through Z2. And by controlling it, we blocked this path um, and we were able to control confounding 
without controlling every confounder, uh, which is nifty. Um, and I guess the last last thing is uh, deciding which confounders to control for can have consequences, specifically something called collider bias, where um, whenever two variables meet at another variable, so whenever they share a descendant like this, when you control for that, when we control for y here, we create a relationship that might not have existed before. Um, so just to illustrate how that could be a problem, um, if we have this xy relationship here, and uh, we see that there's three confounders, there's C, which is just a simple one, and Z1 and Z2 that exert their confounding influence through C. Um, it might look like controlling for C will solve everything. It'll, it'll eliminate C as a confounder, and now Z1 can't get to the outcome, and Z2 can't get to the exposure. Um, but we will create a backdoor path, um, where now by controlling for C, we've created this association between Z1 and Z2, where now X is indirectly related to uh, Y again through this path, and that is a problem. Um, so an alternative is to control for C in addition to one of the other ones. Uh, so now we've blocked that backdoor path.